Today I'm going to be looking how uh, how we measure earthquakes, um, particularly using three different types of scales to measure the strength of an earthquake and the effects that they have. So the first um, scale is called the Richter scale, and this is something that measures the strength or what we call the magnitude of an earthquake according to the amount of energy that is released during the event. So that makes sure that we know that that is energy that is released. And we measure um, uh, earthquakes using this thing called a seismometer, which I've sh shown you on the right. Um, and, and this produces results on a seismograph. What happens is as the earth shakes, it moves this seismometer with the kind of pencil thing attached. So normally um, when the earth isn't moving, um, the, the line will be very, very similar like the one I'm drawing now. But if um, we have an earthquake event, what would happen is the earth um, shakes rapidly and violently. And so it would start normal and then you would get these big lines. So it's these big lines that we're looking for that show us that we have an, an earthquake event happening. So the Richter scale looks at the amount of energy released in an earthquake and it has a numbered scale. So it goes from two and it goes um, up to eight and over. And we should look at some comparisons to, to show what a number two on the um, Richter scale means in terms of energy. So a number two would be the, the equivalent, and in this picture I've shown it, of a, like a mine blast using explosives. But if we get up to something like a seven, then that would be the same amount of energy um, as the largest uh, nuclear test that they ever did. It's something called the SAR bomb. So there's quite a change in the amount of energy. Um, the, the scale that's used is actually something called a logarithmic scale. And this logarithmic scale means that for every um, one point we go up on the scale, the energy increases by over 30 times. So what that means uh, in actuality, it means so if I've got this on the scale on the right, I've got a, a one magnitude earthquake and a number three. If I was going to um, go up in the scale um, from one to two, the amount of energy increase between one and two would be 32 times more energy between one and two. So if I then go from two to three, again, that's another 32 times more energy released from a number two earthquake to a number three. So that means if I go from a one um, uh, Richter scale earthquake to a three, that would be 32 times 32, which means that a number three earthquake is a thousand times, over a thousand times more powerful than a number one on the scale. An important thing to understand is even though we have that Richter scale, we don't have um, that many that will be at the top of that scale. So the largest ever um, recorded on the Richter scale is a 9.5. And that was this one here in Chile in 1960. As you can see, very few of those are happening. Um, but we do get a lot happening that are below two. So over a million um, that are under two. And it's important to know that if it's a, a two, that that won't ca cause a lot of damage. And even though you get less of them, but if we have something in this scale of uh, six, seven or eight, as we can see here, you get either great damage and loss of life or you get moderate damage. Um, so just to, important to know that the frequency of phase, we don't get that many of the really high um, magnitude earthquakes, um, but we do get lots and lots of the ones um, that are very, very low magnitude. Another scale that is used to measure the strength of earthquakes is called the moment magnitude scale. So this is a newer scale than the Richter scale. It has similarities in that it is logarithmic, uh, but the energy is calculated from the amount of rock movement that occurs um, on, on the fault line. Um, so how this works is if we have this conservative plate boundary here, um, if a large area of rock moves, um, on the fault line, then that will release more energy. This is seen as a more accurate way of um, measuring the earthquake and being able to compare um, across different parts of the world. So the last scale is the Macaulay scale. This is measuring something quite different to the other scales. This measures how um, people experience uh, the earthquake. So when they actually feel it. Um, it also measures the amount of damage done. Um, and this is obviously quite important when we're looking at the scale 
and the strength of earthquakes. So on um, the scale we've got below, again, it's a numbered scale. Um, if we've got in this one to three section down at the bottom, this is where um, you know it's not generally felt, or if it is felt, then it's literally only enough to kind of um, you know, move the lamps in the house very, very gently. Um, but if we get up to five, this is where kind of objects are falling um, off of shelves. So we've got slightly more damage being caused there. Um, when we get up to the kind of seven period, this is where you would start to get kind of ha damage to actual houses. So house damage in terms of cracks in walls, um, maybe kind of tiles falling off roofs, chimneys falling over. But then when you get up into this eight and nine category, this is where you have got houses collapsing, major infrastructure damage and kind of cracks in the ground. So this is where you get um, very, very serious damage felt by a lot of people uh, in an area. But you can use things like the Macaulay scale and the experiences that people have um, to to make maps. So here was a um, earthquake that happened on the east coast of America, which is a very rare place for it to happen. Um, and in this blue area, if I circle um, this blue area all the way around pretty much here, we can see that um, if you look at the scale down here, it's not felt and it's very, very weak. Um, so all the people in that area didn't really have any um, side effects. However, if we look right close to where the star is, um, all this area here is in this strong to very strong. So we've got some light damage. And that is because that is close to where the epicenter of the earthquake was. So those people where they were closer to where the earthquake happened would have experienced the biggest effects and the most damage in that area. It's important to understand that it's damage does not just um, depend on the strength of an earthquake. There are lots of other factors that can um, affect the amount of damage. So here's an example just to prove that strength doesn't always lead to wider destruction. Um, this Alaskan 1964 um, earthquake 9.2, which is what is the second largest um, recorded of all time, that only had 128 deaths. Um, it did have quite a lot of economic damage, but very few deaths. But meanwhile, that in Haiti in 2010, and um, there was a, a seven um, Richter scale earthquake, that which is a thousand times less energy than that 9.2. But that had hundreds of thousands, um, over 300,000 people died um, in that earthquake. And so we need to make sure that we don't always just associate the strongest earthquakes with the most damage. And I'm going to um, look at some other factors that can cause sometimes smaller earthquakes to have more um, damage. So some of the factors that might impact the amount of damage that's done by an earthquake uh, would include the time. So if the seismic waves have been going for a longer period of time, if the earthquake lasts longer, uh, then you're going to have probably more shaking and therefore more damage. Um, so if you've also got, um, it depends where it happens. If this happens in an area, a rural area, um, compared to maybe an urban area of population density, you're going to have different effects. If it's in an urban area, you're more likely probably to get more damage because we have more buildings, but also more people living together. And so there's going to be more destruction and damage to property. Um, also, the last one, size of an area. If the area is very large, um, we're probably going to get the kind of damage spread out more and therefore it might be harder to kind of uh, deal with the consequences. Uh, so it, these are just a couple of factors that might impact uh, the damage that uh, is experienced during an earthquake. Other factors to, uh, to consider uh, would be, do people have enough warning? So here's an example of a um, an app that can be used to text people to tell um, them that an earthquake's coming so they can prepare themselves. Um, but if you've got very little warning, um, some people won't have things like apps like this and therefore you'd get a lot of damage. Um, we also, as part of this kind of... Um, preparationness do people know what to do are they well prepared so here's people that are obviously well prepared so they've gone and hid under a table this is because they probably had some sort of education but do places um, 
prepare their populations for them. If there is little preparation, again, there's going to be very high damage. If people don't know what to do, if they um, are not sure what's going to happen during an earthquake, they're probably going to suffer the consequences. The last thing to consider is the aftermath. Do um, countries and areas have things like emergency teams that can get in, get in place um, and help save people? Do they have also the, the financial resources to be able to kind of solve issues afterwards in terms of um, protecting their population, making sure that people, the economy can bounce back and they can repair buildings. All of these various factors would affect the amount of damage that would happen and how long the issues would go on after the earthquake had actually happened.